who had helped arrange this meeting. Uh, and so he will do a formal introduction and our apologies for not alerting you to the to the time differences probably of, of our area okay. as well. Uh, Peter, over to you. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Um, so welcome everyone uh, to this, the first of our academic lectures for, for this year. And it's great that we're off to, I think, a very good start. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Jonathan Campion, um, who is a psychiatrist and is the Director of Public Mental Health at uh, the South London and Maudsley NHS Foundation Trust. He's also Clinical and Strategic Director of Public Mental Health Implementation at the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Very happily, he's also an Honorary Professor in Public Mental Health at, at our university. Um, he's also a public mental health advisor to the WHO and also chair of public, Men the public mental health working group at the WPA. I trust that I have introduced him adequately <laughs> for his talk. Um, today, Dr. Campion is going to outline for us the broad impacts of mental disorder and well-being, and uh, will pre present a, a brief summary of the evidence base for effective public mental health interventions. He will then outline the public mental health implementation failures, sadly, um, and we'll explore some of the reasons for that. And then he will proceed to outline the several opportunities that are available uh, to address some of the implementation failures uh, that we confront in this area. So thank you very much once again, Dr. Campion, and over to you. Thank you so much, Peter, and uh, really delighted to, to be here and to be uh, having this opportunity and also you know, very delighted to be part of such a prestigious department. And uh, I'd really like to um, acknowledge, um, obviously, uh, Professor Stain, but also uh, Professor Crick Lund, who, um, you know, I've been working with over uh, sort of, I guess, over the last couple of years. And I've got my my name seems to have changed to Crick on on my. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm I'm just really acknowledging the fantastic public mental health work going on uh, in uh, in in. Uh, uh, Cape Town. So I'm just going to share my screen. So I hope that um, you'll be able to uh, see my presentation now. Um, and I just wanted to check that that that's uh, that, that you can see that. Yes, yes that's that's fine. Great. Um, so uh, uh, what I would what I'll do is um, I think have I got about 40 minutes or a bit less? Um, I think 40 should yeah that should be fine. Okay. So. Um, yeah, I won't. I won't. You know, I'm. I'm presenting to a very knowledgeable audience. Um, uh, I, I just wanted to sort of briefly define public mental health impact of mental disorder well-being. So, sort of setting the case, uh, the, the 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 existence of evidence-based interventions, um, the gap, uh, the causes of that, and then actions. Um, so, um, in terms of speeding on, in terms of defining public mental health. Um, I suppose, as we all know, you know, there are these different types of, uh, of interventions, uh, but, but obviously public mental health um, is, is taking a population approach to improve the coverage outcomes and coordination of those interventions with, with um, the aim um, of uh, sort of efficiently, equitably and sustainably reducing mental disorder and promoting mental well-being across population. And obviously as practitioners, uh, we're more focused on the individual patient. So um, it's not that uh, obviously focusing on the individual patient isn't important or the, or the particular uh, person, but it's, it's much more a, a population approach. And why is this important? So in terms of the impacts of uh, mental disorder and well-being, I mean, these extraordinary, uh, extraordinary proportion of disease burden due to mental disorder and self-harm but even these figures are underestimated by more than a third and the reasons um, high prevalence of uh, mental disorder majority of lifetime mental disorder uh, arising before adulthood and uh, and a broad range of impacts across health so high rates of health misbehavior 
physical illness, premature mortality, suicide, but also broader impacts um, across pregnancy outcomes, early years, uh, childhood, adolescence, um, and then across the life course. And this, and this impact, um, at the cost, the economic cost, let alone the suffering uh, and, and, and all these kind of cross-sector impacts, are projected to exceed US $6 trillion. Um, but that estimate was 11 years ago. So we're, we're no, we, we know that, 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 that the, the impact is and, and associated costs are huge. And, and similarly, mental well-being has a broad impact, a set of impacts across both health, um, and, and, and other sectors, um, and can be seen as a common good, a common asset. Um, and then briefly mentioning risk um, and uh, risk protector, risk and protective factors, higher risk groups. Um, different factors predict uh, mental disorder and well-being, and obviously a public health approach recognises these uh, wider determinants. Um, and as for cardiovascular disease it's really important that we address um, these, um, we address risk, pr promote protective factors. Um, and risk factors are, for mental disorder are particularly important during pregnancy early years, um, given the majority of lifetime mental disorder arises before adulthood. And therefore child, um, ch a child adversity um, is uh, it, it, it particularly responsible for 30% of adult mental disorder. Um, child mental disorder is also a risk factor for adult mental disorder. So um, we have to be really kind of make, really focusing um, on, on, on particularly more upstream uh, factors. Um, uh, and I know sort of Crick, Crick has done a lot of work on social determinants. And, uh, but I think the risk factors are also important in the perpetuating and relapse of mental disorder once you have, have a disorder. So I think there's, there's something about... Um, us looking at these factors perhaps a little bit more closely. Some risk factors overarching impacts on others, so they trump. So if you look at socioeconomic inequalities and say child adversity, we know that um, it, it, people that from lower socioeconomic groups have a several fold increased risk of child adversity. So again, we're thinking of causes of co the cause of the causes, if you like. Um, I've highlighted COVID-19 here as well as one of those kind of overarching uh, risk factors. And then just briefly touching on COVID, um, uh, we look at the, for instance, the, the direct and indirect uh, impacts uh, on mental health directly, you know, the evidence for increasing the risk of developing a mental disorder and then the increased risk of infection mortality in people with mental disorder, but then the indirect uh, mental um, impacts. Um, so we're looking at, um, for instance, containment measures, uh, which result in temporary increases in mental disorder. But then we look at other groups who've been disproportionately affected, such as children and young people in this country, it's a 50% um, increased prevalence, which actually has been maintained uh, since, um, since containment measures have, have, um, have uh, been dropped. Um, increased alcohol consumption, no evidence in increase of, in suicide at this time, but there is some evidence of increased um, uh, self-harm and suicidal thoughts. And then the impact on risk factors for other mental disorders. I think we're not quite clear about what, what, what that's going to be, but it's like what the impact that's going to be on population mental health. But if we look at the range of impacts, it's likely to be uh, significant. And lastly, I think the, the impact on reduced service capacity, which WHO has highlighted both in its report about the impact of COVID in 2020 and then the Mental Health Atlas, which came out in October. And then lastly, in terms of this section, groups at high risk. So we know particular risk factors congregate in particular groups. And, and uh, essentially, you know, these, these groups um, at higher risk are benefiting disproportionately from both treatment, but also more upstream interventions. So, how, so we, we, we're kind of taking in a, in a population um, uh, sort of perspective, we're trying to balance the, the, the needs of larger groups um, uh, sort of at higher risk with, uh, with um, I guess, the wider population at lower risk. So, so again, that population approach, very important. So in terms of interventions, um, we're, we're, we, as I mentioned, we can, we can think of those uh, interventions in terms of treatment, uh, prevention of associated impacts, um, prevention, uh, and then promotion, or we can 
that look at it in, in this particular way, uh, primary, secondary, tertiary. But I think the key message um, is that treatment alone is not enough. Um, however, when we're in a, in a, in a more um, in, in a setting where there's less availability of treatment, clearly treatment uh, is an important, um, is an important uh, issue to address. One of the challenges with, um, with these different types of interventions is the, is the range of potential service providers. Um, and I've just lifted, list, listed some here, but immediately the, the importance of um, cross-sector cross coordination comes about. And really, again, that, that kind of highlights the need for this population approach. So in terms of mental disorder prevention, um, just kind of highlighting primary, first of all, I think this, this importance of addressing socioeconomic inequalities, um, as I said, which underlie uh, many other uh, risk factors, very important. I've highlighted parental uh, interventions. So, uh, you know, during pregnancy, uh, addressing a parental mental disorder, which can actually reduce offspring mental disorder. Uh, so it's a kind of a treatment to prevent uh, in the next generation. Parenting interventions, uh, and then um, interventions to address poor child um, parent attachment. Um, early intervention for child mental disorder, certainly there's some evidence that that can then prevent adult mental disorder. Um, and if we look at child adversity, as I said before, a range of interventions to address that, um, but such a, an important area given uh, how the proportion of adult mental disorder that it accounts for. Um, violence prevention, um, addressing social isolation, um, ideally uh, preventing physical illness, because we know that physical illness is associated with increased risk of mental disorder, addressing various health risk behaviours, uh, environmental factors. Um, so you can see um, a very broad range of, of those. Uh, and then uh, place-based opportunities really for prevention. I've highlighted just, uh, just some of those, particularly preschools and schools. Um, and then uh, suicide prevention is a, is a related area. Um, and then in terms of secondary mental disorder prevention, I guess we're very fortunate because we have evidence-based treatments for every mental disorder. Uh, but given the majority of lifetime mental disorder arises before adult, this should really be reflected in the level of treatment provision uh, to enable um, early uh, identification uh, and intervention. Um, and that obviously also includes ideally sub-threshold mental disorder. There's certainly evidence that intervention at that stage can help. Although clearly when we're, when we're struggling with uh, with provision of treatment to populations, uh, that, that can often you know, fall down the priority list, understandably. Uh, similarly, early intervention for uh, health risk behaviours, physical or health, once someone has developed a mental disorder is important. And then tertiary uh, disorder prevention. So, of course, this kind of reflects essentially the, the prevention of uh, relapse of associated impacts of mental disorder. And uh, in the UK, uh, smoking uh, is the single largest um, cause of premature mortality. And um, across different mental disorders in, in the UK, there's a seven to 25 year reduced life expectancy. And interestingly, the smoking cessation, you know, there was just a Cochrane review last year highlighting um, the, the impacts, the, the positive impacts on mental health. And that provided by a range of um, providers. Um, physical health, obviously, I've hi highlighted monitoring and intervention, but importantly, targeted COVID vaccination, given this 7 to 25 year reduced life expectancy in people with different mental disorders. And um, mental disorders result in socioeconomic uh, impacts and addressing those can have big impacts on, on recovery and, uh, and, and mental health. Stigma and discrimination, um, suicide prevention, uh, and also violence and abuse prevention. So violence, both perpetration um, and victimization um, important. Um, and then in terms of the, the other side um, of the coin, so to speak, um, uh, we can consider mental well-being promotion uh, at both primary, secondary and tertiary levels. But, but sometimes I find it easier to, to kind of consider it across the, um, the life course. Um, but, but importantly, mental well-being promotion interventions can also prevent mental disorder and stress. So there's an overlap in terms of how we how we cut the cake, so to speak. Um, and I've just highlighted, you know, examples of 
of, of evidence-based interventions at the different stages of the life course. Um, and if we're thinking about living well, obviously that applies uh, across uh, across age groups. Um, but um, but but I guess we're thinking, uh, you know, these these kinds of interventions um, apply uh, at both primary, secondary, and tertiary levels of of mental well-being uh, promotion. Um, and I've put here sort of aging well. Uh, and obviously, if we're if we're if we're uh, uh, in the older age groups. Um, uh, the other interventions will will also be um, applicable. And just finally, in this section, in tertiary, in terms of tertiary mental well-being promotion, in um, in 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 our last um, adult psychiatric morbidity survey, we found that people with um, mental different mental disorders. I think someone's got their microphone. Um, uh, so if someone could unmute that, uh, mute their microphone. Sorry, I, um, uh, I, in terms of tertiary mental well-being promotion, that, there's, that, that we know that people with uh, ment different mental disorders have between a five to thirty times higher risk of being in the lowest um, fifteen percent of population mental well-being. And so again, this targeted approach to the promotion of well-being. Um, in this case, through various interventions, we've got sort of systematic review uh, level evidence for, uh, which which um, uh, can obviously promote recovery. Um, so we can see the overlap. So in terms of then the economics, um, um, often people say, well, great, we've got all these fantastic interventions, but who's going to pay for them? Uh, the economic argument um, is is particularly important, and and I think one of the um, one of the first things to say though is that. If we've got these um, uh, evidence-based interventions uh, that relieve suffering, they're the right thing to do, first of all. Um, but um, th there's also this economic case and the cost of not providing um, these interventions. Um, however, the overall savings, if we're taking a population approach, are related to population covering and coverage. And I think the economic case is therefore, the economic case is helpful for implementation. And if we're looking more broadly, um, implementation of these interventions are a key part of sustainable economic development. If we're looking at prevalence rates, for instance, of, of mental disorder um, and uh, the, the rates of these um, risk factors and protective factors across populations. I've just highlighted as an example, um, uh, you know, just the, the figures in red here were, were an example from um, a piece of work done for the, uh, the the England mental health strategy ten years ago now, but I often just cite it as uh, the, the figures in red are the net savings for each pound spent on different types of uh, uh, intervention. This is a this is obviously an older slide now. I put a reference for a report uh, which kind of gives more updated figures uh, and the references at the end of this uh, slide set. But but I think um, I know Crick um, has been, for instance, doing a uh, doing an economic kind of case for provision in South Africa. But I think, again, all of these things are helpful. These are these are just highlighting that, you know, the, the case for investment. Where can you get these returns on the stock market or any other kind of investment? Um, and in terms of then public mental health policy development, um, I think we, we, we've, we've had some exciting um, uh, drivers for public mental health. So the, the WHO's Mental Health Action Plan obviously highlighted the importance of promotion and prevention as well as treatment, um, and um, also the importance of uh, effectively in strengthening information systems. We've got the UN SDGs, um, make it, which made mental health a key part uh, and committed to treatment and prevention of mental disorder, as well as promotion of mental well-being. And we've got this target of universal coverage by 2030, which applies to mental disorder and also prevention and promotion, which I'll come back to. Um, and then um, the WPA um, has got a, um, its action plan uh, focusing um, centrally on public mental health. So in terms of the public mental health implementation gap and causes, um, as we're all aware, um, the population impact of any intervention depends on, depends on, first of all, whether it works, but also what is its coverage. But we know that globally, um, only a minority of people with a mental disorder receive any treatment, even in high income countries with far less coverage in low middle income. 
uh, and there's far less access to interventions to prevent the associated impacts and negligible coverage to 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 kind of uh, cover more upstream interventions and this gap results in large scale human suffering broad preventable impacts and loss potential and these economic costs and it's it represents a breach of the right to health and has further widened um, during the pandemic and the causes well, uh, taking a public mental health approach, um, obviously a lack of knowledge about size impacts and cost of the unmet need at national level, uh, lack of information about uh, impacts and associated benefits of improved coverage at national level, but also locally, uh, lack of public mental health knowledge and training, not just for health, but also public health and our policy colleagues. Uh, mental health policy implementation is, is really critical majority of countries um, have a mental health policy. But again, there's this real challenge around implementation, which was highlighted in the, um, the uh, WHO uh, um, uh, Mental Health Atlas published last October, as I mentioned. Use of evidence in population health policies and programs, lack of transparency about levels of acceptable coverage, um, taking into account the UN SDG. Uh, lack of resource, I think that's a key area. And you can see this 2%. Um, how does that link with the 18% of, uh, of uh, disease burden? And then specific causes of the treatment gap, lack of skills and staff, uh, low demand uh, linked to stigma. Uh, when people get treatment, um, poor concordance with that treatment, but also um, often lack of quality treatment as well. So in terms of the drivers for improved yes. implementation, um, there's a great opportunity um, in terms of the right to health, um, the UN declarations, the parity with physical health, this UN SDG target of universal coverage by 2030. Now, I'll come to that in a moment, but I think this is a great opportunity. COVID also has really increased, I think, interest in, uh, in mental health by both the general population, but also government. And, has highlighted the long-standing implementation gap and lack of preparedness. And then other organizations. So I've mentioned the World Psychiatric Association uh, and uh, Peter also sort of mentioned the, the Royal College of Psychiatrists new public mental health implementation center. Uh, again, all of these things I think are creating this um, good kind of, I think, um, uh, movement, if you like, uh, of interest. So in terms of the actions to address the gap, um, I'm just going to kind of briefly kind of go through these 12 areas. Um, uh, I think the, the, um, the first um, is, is kind of looking at the assessment of public mental health need. Uh, we know that the gap varies by country and locality, but assessment of current and future gap um, is, is a really important first step. And I've highlighted the different sort of types of information um, and, uh, and I know uh, uh, sort of some of this work's uh, been done in, in South Africa. Um, but it, essentially what we're trying to do is to work out, you know, what are the interventions um, and then what is the gap and what could be implemented? Um, uh, and uh, I guess uh, one of the drivers is also, as I alluded to earlier, what would be the impacts of improved coverage and associated economic savings if we're thinking about um, a broader um, a, a way to influence uh, decision makers. And um, if we took sort of then kind of split that into public mental health practice, so we're doing the assessment and then we're using that assessment to inform policy and strategy, including across different sectors such as uh, education, work, uh, criminal justice, um, and then the transparent decisions about acceptable level of, level of provision and required resource. Um, communication to different agencies and the wider population, and then the actual commissioning of those interventions, um, opera, thinking about how we operationalize, we coordinate with other sectors. Then we implement um, at, the, at the agreed population level, um, uh, and then the evaluation of the both the coverage and outcomes, including to the high risk groups that I've mentioned to prevent that widening of inequity. Um, in terms of the economic savings, again, I've put two, um, two examples here. One was, was just applying some, uh, at some government, um, at some, some England mental health <laughs> economic uh, estimations 
of, of different uh, interventions. And you can see here these huge, um, these huge levels of net savings that are conservative, these are conservative uh, estimates um, through universal provision um, after you've paid for your intervention. And then Dan Chisholm here's um, estimation of net savings from scaling up uh, just treatment for anxiety and depression across 36 countries over 14 years. Um, so essentially the, 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 the story, the message is, uh, you know, this is actually really important part of sustainable economic recovery. Um, and then in terms of, um, I think just going back to the, the, the use of public mental health needs assessments to inform, I think in terms of the transparent decisions, there's something really important here about um, who makes those decisions. And really the decisions need to be by a, a representative uh, section um, of, of society. So we're thinking about, policy makers, we're thinking about obviously providers, but also um, people um, with a mental disorder. It affects almost one in four of us each year in the, in the UK. Um, carers, um, who decides what is an acceptable gap? Um, and then there's something about coming to a collective decision, taking in the right to health, taking in the, the, the impact and cost of implementation failure, and also taking account of those um, huge cross-sector um, impacts. Training obviously is another area and training, um, unfortunately, public mental health tends to fall between mental health and, and public health. But of course, it's very relevant for public health and a range of other um, uh, disciplines, which I've uh, highlighted here. And so how do we do that? How can we provide training, which is quite focused depending on, dep depending on our audience, um, and I think online does offer um, a uh, offer a great opportunity. And then other ways to improve uh, uh, coverage. So certainly improve population knowledge. So we've talked about training in the last slide, but improving, I guess, population knowledge um, is, is important. Um, so uh, I've just mentioned here sort of internet based inter interventions, although that there is evidence that they have a limited impact on health seeking, um, targeted interventions being more effective. Uh, then we think about settings-based approaches. And uh, if we're thinking, for instance, around schools, workplaces, prisons, there's an opportunity to be having a coordinated approach um, to a provision of more than one uh, intervention um, to have, uh, I guess, to have this bigger impact where we've got a, a large proportion or large um, uh, numbers of particular populations in one place. Um, uh, and then uh, another, another way is inter integration. Um, and that integration can be facilitated by needs assessments. So the needs assessments is kind of, it, it is like the map. We know that mental disorder and wellbeing result in these broad impacts across sectors and interventions delivered by um, different sectors. So this kind of can really support integration of mental health into work within a sector, such as between primary and secondary care to facilitate that organization or between sectors. So between, for instance, child and adolescent mental health services and, and schools. Um, so uh, certainly that's important. Uh, digital technology, a uh, great opportunity, um, uh, effectively can, can, can deliver many interventions. Um, uh, and um, and also training. However, we need to be also thinking about um, you know the, um, the the digital uh, gap and and how we take account of those people who don't have have access to to such interventions to prevent uh, widening of inequalities. Um, another area is, is how we maximise existing resources. Um, so um, self management, um, including use of self help, um, digital, um, obviously support from family care as friends, um, treatment resource being maximized through collaborative care, task shifting, um, group uh, rather than individual intervention sometimes, and improving the quality of and concordance with treatment. Uh, obviously WHO has also been recommending for, for several years the moving of expenditure from large hospitals to more local hospitals and community services. And then particular interventions. I think, um, uh, certainly, if we look at how socioeconomic inequalities underlie 
many other risk factors are highlighted before, but also result uh, there are also a result of mental disorder. Um, so uh, I think there's something about how we um, how we sort of have national strategies that could potentially have a huge impact. Uh, I was just looking at the figures uh, in in uh, in the UK uh, for poverty, uh, and it's almost a third of children uh, live in poverty, uh, which is kind of quite extraordinary to think uh, in a in, in a higher income country, but clearly much more relevant in in lower um, and middle income countries. Um, and then thinking about, OK, so what are the population uh, opportunities to address these key areas? I've highlighted parenting interventions um, for treatment of child mental disorder, but also prevention of, of mental disorder and unintentional injury, um, at the promotion of child behavior, parenting, parental mental health, and, and a, a digital opportunity to deliver. Uh, and certainly uh, in a London borough at the moment, we're just looking at the, the, the very low level of these uh, uh, provision of these interventions. And then the numbers um, uh, that, and the huge gap that we've got in terms of provision, and then setting about a stepped care process, thinking about the SDG of universal coverage by 2030. How can we reach that coverage of uh, that universal target for the, in this case, one borough had an estimated uh, 4,000 uh, under 17 year olds who would benefit from um, a 17 year olds with uh, behavioral disorder, um, with um, ADH disorder, and also uh, autistic spectrum disorder, who would benefit, their parents would benefit from parenting interventions, very low coverage. So what are the steps needed um, to be taken by who at various levels over the next eight years to achieve that universal coverage? So just kind of thinking of that example um, and then thinking, who can do what in which sector to collaboratively reach that, that goal. Um, and then addressing parental mental disorder, um, obviously is a, a secondary way to prevent mental disorder in offspring, uh, the child adversity, which I've al already highlighted, uh, and then a physical activity, obviously having this kind of very impressive impact across uh, mental health, uh, uh, across, the, uh, across the life course. And then, um, I think uh, this is my last slide before the summary, um, the use of existing legislation. So we have an Equality Act, we have the Children's Act. Often they don't, you know, they're not kind of used as advocacy instruments, but can be very helpful in terms of saying, what is the duty under the Children's Act to protect, uh, to provide, uh, if we're thinking about adversity. Um, adopting a rights approach. Um, I think the right to health uh, is, is, is extremely um, important uh, as, a, as, a, as a way to, to kind of bring, it's a kind of overarching principle uh, when we think about, you know, the way to prevent this terrible um, uh, sort of population scale suffering and lost potential. Um, and uh, it should be used uh, to advocate for covering. <laughs> and lastly, implementation research. I think We've got such a, a, in, an incredible array of evidence-based interventions, but we know there's a problem with implementation. So I think there's a need for a real focus on, on, on implementation research. So in terms of the key messages, um, mental disorder and poor mental well-being, large impacts across sectors uh, exacerbated by COVID, we've got effective interventions both to treat, to prevent the associated impacts, prevent mental disorder from arising and promote mental well-being. But there's implementation failure with this terrible uh, legacy of a broad uh, range of uh, impacts um, and um, representing a breach of the right to health. Uh, it can, the implementation can be uh, improved in several ways, uh, but there's a need for coordinated approaches between different stakeholders um, and improved uh, implementation um, results in broad public health relevant impacts across sectors and achievement of a range of policy objectives. Um, economic savings, even in the short term, part of sustainable economic development recovery. Um, the mitigation of COVID-19 associated mental health impacts, which would otherwise arise. And this, this important um, uh, sort of uh, goal of UN um, uh, of UN SDG uh, universal coverage by 2030. I think thinking about that, we're certainly thinking about that in the UK in terms of, okay, so where are we now? 
and what are the steps over annual, the annual steps required to, to actually reach that. Um, and finally, yes, public mental health uh, should be an integrated part of the response to COVID. So there's a few references here. Um, I just wanted to also highlight the the, the middle one, the, the, the MindEd e-learning programme. So I, I sort of put that together with Michael Marmot and, and it's just, a, it was a 40 minute um, uh, e-learning package. Um, uh, I can send the link, um, but it, it, it kind of uh, was, was an example of, of, of trying, of how we try and um, give people the, the key messages um, to support that, that wider uh, system transformation. Uh, thank you for your attention. Great. Um, thank you so much, uh, Jonathan, for then for your talk. Um, Peter, should we just ask anyone if they have any questions then? How should we do this? Yes, I think we should do that. I think, um, yes, I, I did say at the start that it was, a, it was a great start for the year in terms of our academic presentations. And I think Dr. Campion has reminded us in a very explicit way about what we confront in this particular area, but also just refocusing, I think, our minds on the several opportunities we have for, for effective intervention in these areas. So thank you very much, Dr. Campion. I've been watching the comments and I, I don't see any. And certainly there's an opportunity for several questions. If, uh, if participants could just alert us by a show of hand or just by importuning themselves and, asking, and just asking a question. I guess while we're waiting, I guess I, I, I'll kick off seeing we don't have anyone in the chat. Uh, you know, you, you, in some ways you're preaching to the converted. You mentioned uh, Crick's work and now we have uh, the ongoing uh, division of public mental health in our department headed by uh, Professor Sawstall. And, uh, you know, this is championing task shifting approaches, uh, the economic case, as you mentioned, also for, for investment and all sorts of other things. Um, so, so, as I say, preaching to converted. Um, can you perhaps um, talk to some of the uh, critique of the public mental health approach and some of the critique of global mental health? Uh, I'm thinking uh, partly uh, the critique of global mental health is essentially exporting Western constructs of mental disorder and Western kinds of interventions and ignoring the African context, um, potentially being somewhat racist to uh, see the recent letter by Sostal and colleagues. Uh, not non-inclusive, uh, contextually inappropriate, and so forth and so on. And then I'm thinking also perhaps, and you know, being from the UK, you might be able to speak uh, more incisively about this, about critique of the IAPT program. Uh, this strikes me as public mental health really uh, exemplified, where uh, an entire nation decides to roll out an evidence-based, scalable uh, psychotherapy intervention. And yet, um, it has not been met with three cheers from all. Uh, in fact, it's been uh, critiqued quite, you know, um, quite severely by some. So, I wonder if you could perhaps speak to the shadow of public mental health, please. Thank you. Yes, I mean, um, I think there's. Uh, I think, as you say, Dan, it, it's um, one of the challenges is uh, the. Uh, the, the the export of appropriate of inappropriate interventions not to a relevant context and I think there's there is a uh, there is a, a challenge I think in terms of global global mental health in terms of what are evidence-based interventions for a particular context so there's something around you know a one size uh, fits all, uh, actually, well, it doesn't. Um, so I think there's something about that, and then there's, I think, the there's something about then the implementation to particular cultural contexts and um, and how the cultural contexts are 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 also a key part of um, of, of implementation. Um, and then I think there's also something about perhaps some sometimes, and I and I find this also working in the UK. Sometimes people think, well. We're not. We're not actually. We don't think these interventions are. Um, we, we don't want to go down this uh, this route. We want to actually have some deter self determination ourselves. We think this will work um, in our borough. Um, and although there's no evidence base for it, um, actually this is what we'd like to do. Um, 
and uh, we'd rather kind of decide what, and in terms of the we, sometimes it's the general community. So then I think this, the, there can be this, uh, not just an exporting to other countries, but an exporting within your own community in terms of how, how is science communicated in a non, um, uh, kind of in a respectful way and how can we have the discussion when we have when we do have for instance the existence of effective interventions even within a particular cult cultural context um, uh, and I think this is something about I think there's also something about communication um, and recognition that some interventions uh, don't uh, don't actually fit a particular population but also some interventions the principles can be then thought about and how can we, if this if this is the principle that works, then what, how could we how might we adapt that for our particular um, for our particular um, country or even our particular district with these set of kind of uh, demands and issues? And I was just speaking with a colleague last week who was saying we'd like to do this in a particular London borough, and I said, well, that's great, and this is what we've done, and I said, yes we could actually look through a literature review to see what's worked, what, what particular element of this, for instance, a navigation uh, a nav navigation for particular ethnic uh, minority communities to services, what's worked um, globally uh, to, to support this. And so we've done this quick kind of review and said, oh, okay, so then it's facilitated dis discussion around, um, so rather than, this is what works, this is what you've got to do, which is kind of a very um, parent kind of child uh, dynamic, um, much more trying to take in these contexts in terms of, because in the end we're talking about implementation and that needs to actually sit well with everyone. Um, I don't know whether that's answered that rather challenging, it's, a, it's obviously a very important, but, um, but challenging, um, area and, and I think the IAC program is a really interesting is, a, is an evidence-based program for people not aware where you have psychological evidence-based CBT for anxiety and depression and it's really well um, it's it's well um, evidence-based in terms of they have very good um, before during uh, and after uh, outcomes data um, and uh, but one of the things is the level of provision. So it's kind of there are targets that limit the coverage, um, uh, and that's still a challenge because it works. There are some people within the psychotherapy or the the, the, the therapeutic kind of providers community who think this is a very narrow approach. How can we think about um, treatment of depression anxiety just with CBT? Clearly, there are other evidence based practices, but I suppose. The 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 the, the um, I think one of the one of the benefits, uh, and I would support. Um, I I certainly would meet it with three cheers in terms of what it's done in terms of uh, really kind of providing an evidence based intervention. But a lot of people feel well, this is imposing a rather one size fits all kind of um, approach to common mental disorder. I can't hear you, Dan. Sorry, you're on mute. Uh, sorry about that. Brilliant. Thank you. That's very helpful. And I see we now have uh, Ian, Ian Lewis, if you've uh, got your hand up. Thanks. So the question I wanted to ask before Dan started was actually the opposite of that. Are there any good news stories that make us convinced that we are at least moving towards universal coverage in 2030 and it's not going to be pushed back to 2040, 2050 as time ticks on? Yes, I mean, certainly, I suppose, it, you know, we had this rather large kind of um, hiccup with COVID, didn't we? And I think certainly that seems to put things back. Um, I think, um, uh, I think, I must say that it does feel there's greater awareness of the, of the uh, SDG um, universal coverage target, but I don't hear it enough. I mean, I, I often give talks and people say, what's the SDG of universal coverage, um, uh, you know, in, in my own country. And, and so I think it's, it's important that we're highlighting that. And um, I, I would say, you know, for instance, in terms of a good news story, WHO Europe has got 
um, the um, SDG of universal coverage by 2030 very much in the spotlight for the European region, which covers almost a billion people in 53 countries. Um, in terms of the, the, their current flagship program, that's looking at how to support this population approach to improved implementation. Um, I think there's, I mean, for me, I, I'm a little bit frustrated because it's not just going to happen. Um, we, I, I think there's something that, that is required as I was trying to kind of highlight in my presentation around the steps. Where are we now? What, what could we do and how? Um, what's the best level by different, for instance, sectors, primary care, secondary care, um, other sectors, for instance, for treatment in terms of where are we now in terms of the overall, say, treatment coverage for common mental disorder in whatever country? Um, and then who could do what, where, realistically? Uh, and what, what are the current obstacles to achieving that? How could that be met? And then what numbers could we be thinking about? There's something about uh, that's been done in some countries, but I think um, you, you know, there's something about that population approach to um, which, which I think people are more thinking about now. But um, but I think I agree, Ian. There's a risk that this is just there's no, that, that there aren't enough concrete. Um, uh, but I, I highlighted in terms of a good example, <laughs> WHO Europe, uh, in terms of their flagship. Um, yes. Uh, are you aware of any um, other good work, Ian, in this area? You asked the question, so I assume that you. That you do so I, I asked the question really because working as a clinician it doesn't look like things are improving that dramatically and so the sort of rather idealized version of universal coverage in such a short term just seems completely bizarre from when, when we're sitting it just I was hoping you'd tell me at least trends are going in that direction a kind of a Hans Rosling kind of approach that things are not as bad as we think they are <laughs> yeah I think I, I, I mean I would it's challenging, and I think COVID has made that challenge more more difficult. Um, but um, I think the key thing is putting it in front of policymakers and a broad range of stakeholders. And I think this this collaborative approach uh, with a broad range of stakeholders, you know, if it's one in four of us um, have a, a mental disorder each year, and then uh, that's every family in the land. It's actually a universal issue, which I think is a real opportunity because we can come together. It creates this kind of awareness. Obviously, there is stigma, uh, but I think there is this opportunity to be bringing together a broad range of stakeholders together with policymakers, uh, together, together with Treasury, to be thinking, look, look at this broad set of impacts. And then the opportunities, again, with a broad range, range of policymakers from different sectors to say this is an opportunity to help you achieve your policy um, you know objectives uh, in a particular time frame together with all this kind of broad set of benefits I think there's there's a good news opportunity here particularly for politicians as well so I suppose for me kind of thinking around there's an opportunity to be grasped I don't see it's being grasped as much as it could be. And that's been my reflection and perhaps yours as well. I don't know if that's correct. I find myself wanting to meet Ian's challenge uh, of coming up with Hans Rosling kind of statement. And the one that comes to mind is, you know, we, we do have this issue with what Vikram Patel has referred to as the credibility gap. Um, I, I agree with everything you've said, Jonathan, about the one in four, but it does sometimes create a credibility gap. And the Hans Rosling point of view here would be, well, that's 75% of people are mentally healthy. That's pretty damn good. We've been doing something, right? Um, okay, over to Professor Ratamani. Professor, so thanks so much. Good to see you, and thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you, Prof. Campion. I just want to go back to task shifting. Uh, in some quarters, there's a little bit of criticism for task shifting. Uh, people are wanting to know whether it means the same thing for high income countries compared to low income countries. They want to know whether it's not really an excuse for uh, poor provision for human and financial resources. Is it really just mainly applicable to low income countries? Uh, kindly elaborate on this a little more. Thank you, Professor Ratamani. Lovely to see you again. I, I think we met, Thank uh, you. We met in yes. Durban, didn't we? I think about eight years ago. Yes, yes, we did. Thank you. <laughs> um, 
Yes, I think, uh, first of all, I think, you know, the task shifting, I, I was having a discussion with some colleagues in WHO yesterday and uh, around primary care and the, the lack of, the, the, the implementation gap essentially. Yes. And, you know, this kind of, this reflection that task sharing can often be seen as task dumping. Um, yes. And, you know, the, the, the overwhelming of already, um, you know, insufficiently trained kind of um, uh, sort of uh, people who are working very hard. So there's something about, first of all, um, it being, uh, being done in a supported way, I think with the appropriate supervision, which does require time uh, and resource. Um, and I think uh, certainly it's very relevant in higher income countries. So it, you know, in, for instance, in, uh, in UK and in minority get any treatment. Uh, and there's a real problem in terms of the access at uh, say primary care level. Uh, there's a problem with just in terms of the, the mm. volume, the numbers requiring treatment, which cannot be seen in secondary care. Um, and so how do we support, I guess, that training uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 in terms of pr professionals um, who are being, being able to, to actually do these kinds of uh, roles with the, with the appropriate support. So I think, is it the same thing in high income countries? No, of course, it's not the same degree, but I think the same principles around um, mm. the need for, I think, appropriate support, um, monitoring um, and uh, supervision uh, yes. is, is there. Um, and it's certainly not a, it's not the magic bullet, I think, but, but it, can, it can be part of a, a solution, mm. I think, in terms of improving numbers. I don't know, what are your thoughts, uh, Professor Ratamani? Well, I, I think uh, it is relevant. For instance, we used to have uh, community nurses, psychiatric trained nurses who did advocacy, who visited uh, patients at homes and so on. Now you would not really want to have a, a specialist going around in the community doing that work, which the nurses could do so ve very, very well, you know? Uh, so, so, but those nurses would have been trained by the specialists. So in terms of advocacy, that's very important. In terms of basic screening, and also, uh, you know, educating people about mental illness, uh, that can be done by other people who are well-trained. And um, I find that in countries like Kenya and Uganda, they use this approach very, very much, including in their work with traditional healers. So, so there are areas where it's proven to be very effective, very helpful so that the, the specialists or the general practitioners can come in at a certain level, particularly where you need to prescribe medication or monitor medication or check side effects of, med of medication. So, but of course, in the high income countries, there are many people who are trained as specialists, the infrastructure is different. And, and one may not necessarily see that there's actually also a form of task shifting in terms of um, how the system is organized. Yeah. Um, okay. No, I, I mean, I was just thinking, of, just when you were speaking, I was thinking of an example. I did a, a need assessment for children and young people in a London borough just recently. Yes. And mm. one third were getting treatment. Uh, one third of the estimated um, numbers with mental disorder, uh, uh, this is in under 17s, were getting treatment. And almost all the treatment was being provided by secondary care. A primary yes. care, um, were unable to diagnose um, child and adolescent mental disorder. And instead mm. they, were, they are referring to secondary care. And so mm. immediately we're thinking about, okay, so where is there a big opportunity here in terms of, first of all, training? How, how mm. do we train our primary care colleagues? Um, uh, how can we support them? Uh, what yes. kind of, for instance, um, the, you know, for instance, task shifting uh, people who, task shifting people, people who could support this task shifting approach in terms of those perhaps with uh, a more uh, focused set of skills for this particular group, how might they be able to help our primary care colleagues to, to look at mm. that wider system level provision, of the link up, as you mentioned, with more specialists uh, in terms of advice, training for the broader yes. primary care, but, but also thinking about that particular workforce group that I think mm -hmm. would... Um, would potentially have a huge impact uh, to, to kind of 
meet the needs of a large proportion of those with mental disorder, which perhaps at lower intensity that don't meet threshold for. Um, but I, again, I think, as you were saying, that that link up with um, education, um, support from specialists, um, um, uh, but, um, but they do offer that opportunity also around screening. Um, yeah. Yes. Thank, thank you very much. Great, thank you. A great note, I think, on which to end things. I think, I think, Peter, there's there's a range of questions in the chat box, but I'm just worried that people um, did schedule this for um, to end now and probably have to get back to yes. their, their clinical jobs. So, from my side, thank you very much, Peter. From your side, yes, from my side, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Um, thankfully, um, the questions there were three questions in the chat which I think would have been valuable to hear you answer individually, but to a large extent, and I, I trust that the questioners will, will understand that to some extent you did answer all of those questions in the other verbal ones. So thank you once again, and thank you very much to everyone who attended our lecture today, and I trust to, we'll see you again in a month's time. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>